Hey guys, we're back. What episode are we up to now, Mark? Oh man, I'm I'm, I'm really running out of fingers here. <laughs> is this, is number, this six? Six? Yeah, wow. number six? Yeah, number six. We're fully going into like Jason Pretty territory now. And is that six like S Y X X six? Yes, it is. And we open live, baby. <laughs> we're going straight up the river. So, so what are we talking about to today, Johnny? Uh, more, more wrestling tonight. More wrestling. We've got a special presentation for you. It's kind of a double feature this weekend because I had a talk with Bjorn yesterday about Memphis wrestling. We're going to be talking Fantastic about a, talk. some. Ah, oh, thanks. Um, thanks to Bjorn, it was because I don't know a damn thing about Memphis out of the two weeks of research I put into it and a lot of hours. <laughs> But yeah, we've got a special presentation talking about a very cool event from the 1980s. And we've got uh, just a little little, little fellow here who wants to um, say hello. He popped up on the show with Bjorn yesterday for anyone that saw some of the ultimate lies. He's back for a sequel. He's come back. Hulk Hogan, 90s, he's still lying. He invented the telephone, single-handedly won World War II. Stayed up all night eating 50 slices of American cheese and broke every bone in my body when I threw Superman into the sun, brother. All true lies. He also worked 366 days a year, which is really impressive. Yeah. I think he fought off the Greeks and the Spartans in the ancient world too and actually won the world, won democracy for the world. Like this is another one of his achievements. And, and he flew around the earth when Lois Lane died to, to ch change time and to save Lois Lane. Sounds about right to me. Yeah. I believe he I believe he mentioned that in the true history of WrestleMania documentary. Yes. I believe he did. <laughs> we probably don't, oh, yeah, don't so have the right to the footage show. <laughs> we're gonna be talking about uh WrestleMania, as in the very first debut, WrestleMania. And it was a pretty cool event, and I, I still like it to this to this day. And you know, it's still going. They still do them every year and all that. But the the first few in the '80s going into the '90s, those ones are just they're, they're so iconic and such legendary uh, episodes. <laughs> yeah, I've really grown to to love the first one in particular. When I was yeah. When I was younger, especially in my teens, I wasn't that fond of it. I kind of looked at it as, as this kind of relic of the past. And mm -hmm. it seemed just so kind of dark and gritty compared to what I was kind of watching <laughs> currently at the time. Whereas yeah. now I go back to it and I just love I, all, all the things that I, I kind of tried to shy away from as a teenager is all the stuff I love now as an adult. So I love yeah. the fact that it's all kind of dingy and grimy and it's taken place in Madison <laughs> Square Garden but it's really yeah. poorly lit it looks like yeah, you get all that it's 1985 it, it looks like something from the 70s even though it's the 80s yeah, it does. That's true. yeah the, I, I don't know what I don't know what happened when they get into the 90s but and, I mean you had better quality I don't know cameras or whatever but but they they worked out better how to film things without getting all that goddamn glare from the ceiling house lights and stuff that shine down because you see so much of that anything from the 60s through to the 80s you're always getting those lights like a strobe effect blinding you when you're watching the show yeah it's a it's a unique look of the time mm. and no other wrestlemania will will look like this one i can guarantee you no, that. definitely not but yeah we've got got our first slide here and i'll bring it up so i can actually see the damn thing on my screen uh, so the first WrestleMania took place on March 31st, 1985. It was a groundbreaking event in professional wrestling organized by WWF. That, that's the proper name, not the stupid name they have now. Held at Madison Square Garden in New York City, the show combined sports entertainment with mainstream appeal, headlined by a tag team match featuring Hulk Hogan and Mr. T against Roddy Piper, I should say Rowdy Roddy Piper, and Paul Orndorff. WrestleMania set a new standard for spectacle promotion and wrestling the event success laid the foundation of the annual wrestlemania extravaganza which has become the flagship event of the wrestling calendar it 
apparently has. And this is WrestleMania before there were numbers. Yeah. So, you know, I always refer to it as like WrestleMania <laughs> 1, but it's not WrestleMania 1. It's just WrestleMania. Yeah. It's not Wrestle, but it's not, <laughs> it's not PlayStation 1 or WrestleMania 1 until the sequels come along. Exactly. Which does make it confusing if you've been around. If it's something in your own lifetime that started and been a big thing like this, and it's had all these sequels, when you look back or try and research stuff on the internet, it's a pain in the fucking ass because every time it'll refer to WrestleMania 30 or 20, it's like, no, you used to be able to use Google and get the results you want. I just want WrestleMania bloody well one, not everything else. <laughs> okay. So just a look going into a little bit of what was going on at the times in the early 80s. The background sort of leading up to WrestleMania. We also had a fairly important event called Starcade 83 from the Jim Crockett promotions. Yeah, and take a look at this poster. There's some stars uh, especially in Johnny. Yeah, there, yeah, there's some some real stars. And uh, as Johnny pointed out to me earlier before this show actually started recording, there's a certain Mr. Hulk Hogan advertised yeah, right there the for, for Star Daniel and Hulk Hogan, then it versus uh Dick Slater and Cowboy Bob Orton. So he wasn't in Starcade 83, but he was on at some point he was on the card for that before his I don't know his deals were finalized to go and do whatever else he was doing. But uh, I love but that Hogan, H Hogan's not on it, but at least you know we've got we've got Piper there who Piper. is We've yeah, got Greg Valentine. Yeah, uh, that Buddy Rose, match. he's there. And Ricky Steamboat. So you've got four here. Yep, Steamboat. Who, who've done both Starcade and WrestleMania. Yeah. And then and then it's got their like main match of Harley Race, Ric Flair, who's you know, two massive icons. But my favorite from back then is easily the Unfortunately, I don't have the full Starcade DVD. I've got like a highlights one that shows some of the early years. And then I've got the uh, Roddy Piper three disc set. And that one has the Piper Valentine dog collar match where he like busted his ear and all that and went, went deaf on one side and got, you know, both just mutilated each other for 30 minutes. <laughs> Such a brutal match. And as, and as horrifying as that match is, then I was reading in his biography. They went out and had to do it about 20 or 30 more times as they were touring around, but also when it's not on the non-televised versions. Yeah, I'm sure his ears, face, head and neck all look yeah. wonderful after that run yeah. of shows. But yeah, that, that was, yeah, that look, was an amazing, uh, amazing match. Yeah, and, and the NWA, I suppose, look, it has to be said before we get into the WrestleMania, NWA did kind of get into that big mega wrestling extravaganza show hmm. this was the WWF yes it was a big deal and um you know i think it was it was on closed circus tv as well at a lot of locations yes, yes. where you, you know you'd, you'd get tickets to go into the place and actually watch mm -hmm. it live um yeah. you know on a big screen or whatever but uh still like it's, it's a massive deal and you have to no matter what vince mcmahon or any WWF slash WWE Stooge might say in a documentary, there's no way that uh, the WWF didn't draw inspiration from how yeah. Starcade was, you know, promoted and run and, you know, generally executed because, you know, as as we'll go on to see with WrestleMania and beyond, the, the WWF definitely emulated that strategy. Yeah. And the, I mean, they, they saw that a big event being pulled off it was possible to make, make make some real money and they're like we want to make some real money too so <laughs> we want to have our own event <laughs> so this is from a vhs yeah. cover scan because it was the best image i could find that actually showed off the full card and the all the matches on there and i love seeing all those like the cheesy graphic highlights on there which you'll definitely see in my, my slideshows because i love all that neon from the 80s <laughs> That's beautiful. Notice as well, uh, Johnny, if you look at the, mm -hmm. at the bottom of the spine of the VHS, this is WF004, yeah. the fourth ever Coliseum video release for uh -huh. for WF videos. I think the first one 
is WWF's funniest moments was the very first video. <laughs> that a real video? Like, that's a real video. That that's a real video. <laughs> um, I can't I can't remember what uh, number two and number three are. I'm sure somebody who watches so it's this. Dom Del- Dom Deloise or Bob Saget just like here's the funniest wrestling. <laughs> oh, pretty much. It's uh, it's like Mean Gene uh okerland oh, in his yeah, studio yeah. uh, uh throwing yeah. back to just you know oh and here's king kong bundy falling through the ropes yeah. and stuff oh, like just that like you know? on those, just like on the dvds where they got mankind or whoever and so you know like narrate them all in it and... yeah I'll I'll, I, I, love, I love an old cover and even the flaking at the top like just shows it it's like, it's like real vintage it's the, the flaky cover it was love yeah, and like, and like VHS um, home video became a massive market in the like mid to late eighties, and a lot of it was kicked off by kids stuff like strawberry shortcake and Care Bears and st- stuff like that, that proved that uh, home sales could actually be feasible. Because before that, VHS were very very expensive, like too expensive for the average person to buy. So when they started doing like kids market and other stuff like this, like wrestling, they really brought the prices down. So it wasn't a price to sell to a video rental store anymore because there's only way i could see things but you, they brought the prices down so you could actually buy something take it home and watch it again and again that became a massive market for them it was a massive deal and and you know to be honest with you if it wasn't for vhs you know i wouldn't have been able to watch this or, or most no, no, of no, like right. the, the wrestlemanias that, and, and other wrestling events that i that i watched as a kid because we like in my house, you know, we didn't have like Sky or cable or any way to get wrestling live. No, so I'm in New Zealand. Anything, anything I was getting was either a video shop rental of a years old event, or if I was lucky yep. enough to right. know somebody, um, if you had friends whose parents did pay for, you know, satellite or whatever, did pay for wrestling for you sometimes. But well, it had been very, yeah, just, very rare. Yeah, and, and people have re- rent and record stuff. You know, you could watch your friends dodgy bootleg yes. and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a far cry from having access to a, an online network where you can just go on and yeah, watch any it's, of this it's like on a, a whim. dream to be able to watch stuff like that now. And they've finally added. See, they scrapped the official network in Australia last year, right after I started watching the damn thing about, about two months in, after they had it up for, I don't know, eight, nine years here. And then they replaced it with some other local network thing, but it's got all the usual Australian bullshit on there, plus the wrestling, so they're slowly adding things. And as of this month, they've finally added in, like in the last week or two, some old AWA and more NWA stuff that was on the full, full WWE network that's been missing for nearly a year here. But I think still missing a lot of the documentaries I, was, I still want to watch. But anyway, we'll get on to the next one. Um, it's giving a bit of um, history of what was going on here before we get on to the main event and all that. So the WWF promotion was founded in 1953 as the Capital Wrestling Corporation, CWC, as a northeastern territory of the National Wrestling Alliance, the NWA. Which used to be like you know a big syndicate that was went all through the 20s through the 50s and 60s in america with all the promotions following the dispute cwc left the nwa and became the worldwide wrestling federation or wwwf in april 1963 after rejoining the nwa in 1973 the wwwf was renamed to just wwf in 1979 before the promotion left the nwa for good in 1983 and that's also why they ran into troubles later on with the um, world wildlife fund when they went down to just the two letters because they <laughs> eventually they ran into all sorts of trademark and copyright issues that became a problem um the company's majority owner is it is is it is excuse me it's executive chairman third generation wrestling promoter vince mcmahon and this here is quoted directly from the wikipedia page and uh, we'll go on to the next one a bit more boring old text so overview of Vince McMahon's acquisition of wrestling territories in the 80s, ex- the expansion. McMahon's primary goal was to expand his promotion, then known as WWF, from a regional entity in the northeastern United States into a national and eventually global powerhouse, which a lot of the other territory guys were very closeted and fearful and secretive and, you know, right to be wary of Vince because he was aggressively expanding and buying up whatever he could. Um, 
1980, McMahon, the chairman and the CEO, executed a bold and controversial strategy to consolidate power and dominate the professional wrestling industry in the United States. The strategy involved buying up various wrestling territories, which were regional wrestling promotions that operated independently in different parts of the country. And he did this by several ways. He had talent raids where he went and pinched whoever he could from other promotions. He had the national cable television. He realized the importance of cable as becoming a new sort of mainstream thing and more affordable for people and that wrestling was going to be a big part of that. And they expanded the market share, getting to boring old business terms. Um, as they expanded their reach, it often ran shows in different competition with established regional promotions. McMahon's strategy was to saturate these markets, drawing fans away from local promotions and ultimately putting many of them out of business. And he pissed off a lot of people, including local fans, especially in the southern states, where they lost their show or he would pinch the wrestlers or he would buy the promotion. If he couldn't buy the promotion, he would buy their time slot or their whatever network or show. He would, he would find a way to weasel his way in and eventually just take things over. You know, kind of, kind of like a mafia don, you know, just come in. Just do whatever you want and push everyone out. Uh, so this leads up to WrestleMania in 85. McMahon introduced WrestleMania, an annual mega, mega event that still runs today. Um, combined wrestling with mainstream entertainment elements, WrestleMania became a massive success and played a pivotal role in catapulting the WWF to national prominence. Legal challenges. McMahon faced legal challenges and backlash from other wrestling promoters who felt threatened by his aggressive tactics. Um, several legal battles ensued, but McMahon largely prevailed. There's a fair bit about that around. If you get into the history of nitty gritty of stuff, it's it's very dry stuff to read about, but it, it is interesting from a business point of view. Uh, national monopoly. By the late 80s, McMahon had effectively created a near monopoly in the wrestling industry, with the WWF as the dominant promotion in the US. This era is often referred to as the wrestling war and marked a significant shift in the wrestling landscape. In summary, McMahon's acquisition of wrestling territories in the 80s was a strategic move to transform the WWF into a national wrestling juggernaut. Through aggressive talent recruitment, national cable television exposure, and the creation of major events like WrestleMania, McMahon's efforts reshaped the wrestling industry, leading to the WWF's dominance in the United States and setting the stage for its global expansion. So that leads up to you know, like the 90s, 2000s, and to what we have today. <laughs> yeah, and that was uh, definitely perfectly, perfectly summarised uh, essentially what, what Vince McMahon did. And it was aggressive. Like that expansion, like the, it's, it's kind of been done to death. Uh, yeah, you, you could call it an expansion, you know, you know, call it an invasion maybe. The WWF just invaded yeah. all these uh, these other territories and and they made no secret you know, of it. better or worse. Yeah, they, they and some of the some of the tactics were very sneaky. Like and like you're saying, yeah. like one week you could be watching your local promotion on television, and then all of a sudden next week the WWF show is airing in its place, and the guys that you used to cheer for on in your local promotion all of a sudden are appearing on the WWF show, and it just kills the local business straight away yeah. because and you either you either quit watching it altogether or you go to the WWF. Uh, is essentially mm -hmm. your your options there so and you know he just hammered his way through blunt force trauma just kept on going swallowing up territory after territory usually with some you know backdoor deals sometimes he was he was very good at kind of splitting business partners apart and, and making people paranoid of each other by you know may, he might just do deals with one one shareholder in a in a territory and have him fuck over the guy who's He's he's also running things. You know, he did whatever it took to yeah, um, to gain a foothold. <laughs> it was completely ruthless, completely ruthless. But, but also a good businessman, as in like you know, like he's. I'm not talking about his personal character or any dodgy things he's done, but he was an he was an effective businessman. He had a plan. He executed it. He took a lot of risks. He you know he nearly went out of business a number of times, but he he definitely knew what he wanted and went after it. Yes, yeah, and, and you know it's one of those things like for for better or worse, like I could um I could I could sit here and, and talk about all the damage he did to the to the territory uh, wrestling business, but 
truth is that I would probably have never watched wrestling if it wasn't for the WWF because yeah. I wouldn't have seen any wrestling. Yeah, so, <laughs> like wrestling as I know it was introduced to me by the WWF. Um, you know, so now as obviously I've gotten older and like a lot of wrestling fans, you you start to watch other forms of wrestling and you go back to your history and see what what wrestling was like before the the WWF takeover. But ultimately, you know. The reason a lot of countries outside of America and a, and a handful of other countries even know what wrestling is is because of what Vince did in the eighties. Yeah, and just before we move on to the main actual, you know, um, mania and all that, to give a little context to some of those like NWA territories and that heading into the mid eighties, some of those territories were bankrupt or failing long before Vince had anything to do with them through no fault of their own. Just you know, just like any kind of business is upturns and downturns. Some of them had already failed, some had gone bankrupt and were existing on loans or had merged or sold with other regional promotions. So it, it it was a situation that was ripe to be taken advantage of by someone with money and power and the will to actually do something. But it did it did piss off a lot of people, you know, like People used to watching some of the Southern States wrestling, like uh, seeing a more, um, you know, more kind of not necessarily brutal style, but, you know, more bloody and outlandish and stuff. And then the WWF was like trying to be like more family friendly, more cartoonish. Let's make it for every, you know, for the whole family and the kids and something can go out and enjoy a night and not like some maniacs going to come and stab you in the car park or something like in some of the Southern wrestling. <laughs> Yeah, do you want you want to um, tell us about some of these colourful characters? Yeah, well, so part of the strategy, I I suppose, make Mania a success was to have a lot of outside celebrity involvement. So yeah, anybody really that was famous but not involved with the wrestling business per se so obviously look um on top of your list there you've got muhammad ali who's like world-renowned famous Great. billy martin uh you know liberace and the rockheads who actually do uh, a dance routine in the ring uh fair play to yeah. liberace actually of, of all the uh, kind of superfluous kind of celebrities to make appearances on the card he actually seems to kind of get into it and put a bit of effort in like he yeah, does the yeah, dance with right. the rock hats in the ring and then he's got his little kind of he has the special little ring bell because he's the guest timekeeper and stuff he really seems That's to be cool. getting into it whereas um billy martin just looks like he's kind of had a few drinks and he's a bit yeah I, I had to look look up who the hell billy martin was everyone else i had some idea about who they were what they did like, billy martin no i had to look him up so who it was <laughs> Yeah, I get the. I, I, from what I hear, he was just pretty bored all day and just wanted to get a payday <laughs> and, 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 and get, and get oh, out of there. And, get coffee. and uh, you know, obviously, so we've got um, Cindy Lauper here who plays a massive role in the build up to, yeah. to this show. And, you know, for for those like most most of the people watching this will be of a of a similar age uh, to us, but for for those of you who are a bit younger, uh, Cindy Lauper was like a massive star in her day. So to have her involved, especially at a time when she was actually relevant and current and and selling records, it was a massive deal to to have her involved. Um, she ends up being uh, you know Wendy Richter's corner woman slash manager. Yeah. For the, for the women's championship we'll, we'll we'll get to that later but um so apart from and then of course you know we have mr t who is the other mega celebrity uh who's also involved here who was just on fire from the a team and rocky three like mr t he was his own brand in itself like you weren't just getting a a guy yeah. to come on your show you're getting a whole kind of brand that comes with him uh, like mr t just had had star power especially uh, at this time so you've got all these um celebrities coming into the mix but then apart from that you've all these i don't want to say like um extra characters because they weren't just extras they were a really important part of the show and they were the managers yeah. essentially so You've got Bruno you Sammartino like the best of there. All good man great managers. And... Oh, big time. Like, just looking at that list there. And now, 
Bruno San Martino, he definitely won't be remembered as being a good manager, but he is a legend <laughs> in the business. Like he's the longest reigning WWW yeah. champion like of all the time. You know, he's a genuine celebrity, as in like you know he's pretty much retired from wrestling, but he's there as a guest, and he's like for yes. wrestling fans, he's another superstar. Exactly, and he's also um he's also appearing in the arena where he had so much many of his famous matches that he sold out so many times. Yeah. So he's like yeah, apart from um being like a wrestling star he's kind of like almost like a local celebrity as well hmm. that new york crowd he's he's a really big it's deal like, it's like watching the expendables with all the 80s action movie stars it's like well, how many guys can we cram into this thing oh big time and even like like because you got luscious johnny valiant there lou lou albano who actually appeared with cindy lauper in her girls just want to have fun video he's the he's the father in the video Got Freddy Blassie, who's probably one of the best managers of all time. Bobby the Brain, who is the best manager of all time, in my opinion. Anyway, I'm I'm okay with anybody who has different opinions on on these things. Um, well, be wrong. Fabulous Mula is there, who is kind of being erased from history. We can get to that later when we get to her part of the show. Snuka, who is also kind of being erased from history, which we can also talk about once we get to that part of the <laughs> yeah. show. Yeah, and of course, um, Cowboy Bob or- or- Orton. Always has his uh, arm in a cast, uh, father of Randy Orton, who we all uh, know and love. Yep. And finally, and Jimmy then, Hart, mate of the South, who I'm sure yeah, you're yes. well acquainted with now after um, oh, doing yeah, that kind of, uh, research. Because uh, Jimmy, Jimmy's all over the Memphis. All through the 90s and stuff, he's still going around there. <laughs> oh, big and, time, mate, with the most outlandish and colourful jackets in, in all of, of professional wrestling. And, just a note before we move on to the next one. That the reason, if anyone's going, why is Gene Oakland under celebrities? He's just like another old time guy. He's, he's not technically a celebrity. The reason is because someone else was supposed to be in the event who dropped out and he took their place. So he wasn't there as a referee or commentator or not. He, he was singing the national anthem. And it, just, and the, it says right. um, when you look it up that they don't tell you, they haven't publicly said who was supposed to be in that role, just that it was meant to be some other celebrity who dropped out at the last minute. So me and Jen got, had to stand in and sing the bloody anthem. <laughs> so I'm guessing I'll, it would I'll have been a musician um, or something. To be fair to, to me and Gene, he, he, he stepped up because you can actually tell when you watch the, the event and watch him singing, he's actually got, He's got the words to the national anthem on a piece of paper in front of him. He clearly <laughs> was a last minute kind of, okay, yeah, we yeah. need you to go out there and just kind of do this. <laughs> but he, uh, he's a champ, you know, he he gets through it. He gets the audience to sing along with him to kind of help yeah. him out. But you can just tell it's kind of like, oh, I wish I wasn't having to do this mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, when I was watching stuff this week about um, like Memphis stuff, I was looking at old interviews with Jerry Lawler. There's an episode in the early 90s with Raw where Macho had left suddenly. He was off to WCW, and Vince is like, well, we need someone to commentate. King, can you step up tonight and do it? And he's like, well, okay, I guess. And then he became, you know, a major commentator for them for years. So something's just kind of happy accidents. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Move on. So we're going now into the actual matches, and they're just in, like, chronological order. We've got Tito Santana, who defeated the Executioner, who was a masked wrestler that was Buddy Rose. He did indeed defeat him quite quite quickly as well. Oh yeah, I suppose <laughs> just before we, we move on, I should mention on, on commentary for this is uh, Jesse Ventura and uh, Gorilla yes. Monsoon. I forgot to, to, to read them out there on, on, on the commentators. But yes, uh, so Tito the Santana defeated the Executioner. There's a, there's a format on this show um, that essentially goes backstage interview match, backstage interview match, backstage interview match, rinse and repeat. And yeah. it it works for a show like this because the show is a pretty short runtime and a lot of the matches on on the undercard are are quite short. So, you know, prior to seeing the competitors go out, it will usually cut the backstage of Mean Gene standing in the locker and you'll have like say Tito, he says his best, then the executioner says his bit and then they'll go out and, and have a match. So that, that format is kept up for the for the whole show. Um this match uh it's pretty funny actually the in the interview before this match like Buddy Rose under a mask because they don't want to actually tell anybody it's Buddy Rose. He's yeah. like, Tito, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna work on your leg 
I'm going to target your leg. It's like he just tells him his whole strategy of what he's going to do <laughs> before he goes out and has, has the match. And then uh, so Tito just goes out and beats him you know, because he knows he knows what to do now after after hearing that interview. But yeah, it's a it's a kind of it's a quick match really designed, I suppose, to to make Tito look good and uh, continue the, the feud between Tito and Greg Valentine, who we'll be seeing later on in the show, because the reason the executioner wants to work on Tito's leg in the first place is because Greg Valentine had actually attacked him recently and and injured his leg so that's why the executioner is smelling blood in the water as jesse ventura <laughs> would say and he's uh he's going after that limb but uh his attempts are unsuccessful and uh tito manages to to beat him in the end okay we'll go on to the next one so the next match i mean as boba said we've got had intercut was like interviews and promos and stuff throughout the event and the next match, we had David Sammartino with Bruno versus Brutus Beefcake with Luscious Johnny Valiant, which went to a no contest. Yes, it, um, it all went a bit crazy at the end of this match, so the referee essentially had to had to throw it out. I think what's, <laughs> what's funny about this match, um, when I was watching it back recently, it's how... Nobody cares about David San Martino at all. You actually <laughs> kind of feel sorry for the guy. It's like yeah. he he walks out and it's like, oh yeah. And then his dad comes out behind him and everybody just goes crazy for his dad. And his dad isn't even <laughs> wrestling in the match. So anytime David is doing anything in the match, the crowd are kind of a bit quiet. But anytime like Bruno gets involved in any way at all, even if he just puts his like hand on the rope, the crowd go wild. All they want to do is uh <laughs> is cheer Bruno. But poor David, yeah, he just becomes this kind of kind of afterthought. No, it's um, I think this is like the longest match or one of the longest matches on the show on the on the undercard. Um, it, it's pretty uneventful. I think um, like we were saying earlier, that the main appeal was really getting Bruno to appear yeah. on the show and just to do something on the show. Um, I will say at this point of his career, Brutus Beefcake looks pretty impressive in the sense that he's kind of almost ahead of time in terms of luck he's kind of got the oiled up muscle man physique yeah yes. and he's wearing the kind of you know the the spangly kind of bright colored spandex and stuff he's he's essentially setting the the tone for what the style would be in the company going forward because pretty soon yeah, was... in the next few years there's going to be loads of guys who look uh, physically, like Brutus Beefcake wandering around. Yeah, if you get your black trunks, we're going full neon and spandex. <laughs> and uh, Luscious Johnny is is brilliant in this as well. He's just a great manager, and definitely he was he was essential for Brutus's package back in the day. Because when you're watching the backstage interviews, like Brutus can barely get a word out without like tripping over himself, and just he just <laughs> can't really cut a promo at all. So uh, Johnny Valiant can just yeah. step in and just rhyme off some great insults to get everybody hyped for the match. Yeah, but, I, was, um, I was reading um, Piper's autobiography recently, and well, according to him, so if it's wrong, I mean, blame him because I read his bloody book. But in Piper's book, it's it was um, one of the shows where the shows all the Piper's pit where the f Beefcake first used the big um, shears to cut cut the guys here, and that's when they started calling the Brutus the Barber Beefcake. And then they started always coming out with the shears after that and having more of a gimmick. That's right, which would eventually go to a full-on, you know, baby face turn, and you know, yeah. got a got a pretty solid run out of the company. I suppose he was friends with Hulk Hogan in real life as well, which probably yeah. helped him. Because what, like, one thing I'll say about Brutus, even though he always looked physically good, he was fairly limited in the ring and on the microphone as well like he wasn't going to be lighting the the audience on fire with his brilliant promos or interviews he was really not that memorable but once they gave him the barber gimmick he really got it over and just kind of played into the whole ridiculousness yeah. of it and like like run into the it, ring it with his shears the and stuff. sort of character of that era yeah it fit him it fit him definitely but and you know, and like like I said though, to his credit back here, he does look ahead of his time from a look perspective anyway, because 
watching this WrestleMania, one thing that does kind of stand out is you see a lot more what I would describe as normal looking physiques as opposed to big muscled up steroid bodies. Like in yeah. a few years time when you're watching like WrestleMania, like four and five, all you see is like steroid bodies practically. But but back then, they still have a kind of nice mix of guys who, you know, they look like someone who was big and strong, but they didn't look like crazy mutant, you know, superhero yeah. guys. Like, I, I, you know what? You can always pick like a classic wrestler physique because they're kind of barrel chested and round. I mean, like a San Martino, they're round in the middle. They've got big, powerful thighs, and the, their arms and biceps are afterthought because the power center in wrestling or combat sports is your hips and you know, your lower back through to your hips and you know your legs. That, that, that's all the power you need for like wrestling from suplexing or throwing or doing an arm bar and jujitsu or whatever you need this, you need that power having big crazy pumped up biceps really does nothing from a sport point of view for actual you know for proper rest this is show wrestling but for, you know for actual wrestling wrestling that really does nothing <laughs> yeah and uh, and the irony of it is that is that like even old man bruno at this point of his life can probably manhandle like yeah. their current roster like you know who who all look like you know adonis's in comparison but he probably would have been like physically stronger than them yeah i'd say so in terms of like functional movement yeah i'd say you could like easily just fling him around like a rag doll <laughs> oh yeah we'll go on so and speaking of also good um physiques we've got in this one uh ricky the dragon steamboat who defeats matt bourne Yes, Matt Bourne, who will in the future go on to become Doink the Clown. Yeah. And yeah. Ricky Steam Ricky Steamboat, who will become a dragon. <laughs> but uh yeah, yeah, so this is actually um I suppose from a, a purist wrestling point of view, even though it's another short match, it's actually quite a quite a good match. And you know, there's some if uh, anybody who's watching from the current generation you'll probably see a few modern uh, wrestling maneuvers that you'd still see used regularly today probably too much to be honest <laughs> but uh no this, this is a really fun match um steamboat is fairly fresh in the company this is before he's done the long tights and gotten pushed towards uh you know the intercontinental title born is also fairly fresh and and, and born He's not going to be sticking around for too long after this match. So I think he's around for a little while and then he goes away. And by the time we see him again, he's coming back in like 90, at the end of 92 or beginning of 93, maybe, um, doing the the Doink the Clown gimmick. So it's weird kind of seeing him back here just as a normal guy, as himself, essentially, Matt Bourne, just a kind of straight-laced heel wrestler with no kind of gimmicky attachments or anything like that steamboat looks great as well um, yeah he, look, he looks great it's one of those nice. good yeah he just looks like he 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 is kind of like almost like a real life bruce lee physique there especially when yeah. i was watching the footage recently he's just he's just thick yeah and but he's also incredibly kind of like fast and, and athletic as well. it's, it's funny though because he he looks kind of asian and because he does chops like straight away jesse ventura is like Ricky Steamboat, he's a martial arts expert, you know, because he hits a job. <laughs> like, you know, so, you know, the martial arts expert, Ricky Steamboat, you know. But um, yeah, I, I, it, this is a, it's one of those things. I, I suppose I just want to throw it out there. Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura are just brilliant on all the matches. Commentating on this, there's um, there's too many little back and forth quips and one liners from each of them to to really quote. There, there, there's so many, but they, they definitely um. They definitely ham it up big time, and and in this match, this match especially with, with all the um the kind of Ricky Steamboat martial arts stuff, they come out with just some crazy karate references and, and things like that to describe Steamboat's <laughs> Steamboat's offense. Um, it's a pretty cool finish to this match as well because Steamboat hits him with like the high diving cross body to to pin him, which is a pretty cool for 1985. You know, it's it's pretty cool to see a a dude leap off the top rope like that and like that catch a pin once again it's a it's a move now that you'd probably see like 10 times in the same show because everybody just does high flying moves but 
back then, Steamboat really kind of was a bit of a. I, w- I maybe wouldn't go as far as calling him a trendsetter, but he was definitely in the upper echelons of, you know, top in ring workers who would have really good matches with nearly anybody, as long as you put them in there with a competent heel, like somebody like Matt Bourne, he's going to have a, a good match with them. And if you put him in there with a really good heel, like we'll see in a couple of years' time when they put him in there with Randy Savage and, and, yeah, and you sure. know, you know, you're going to see some real, some real magic there. But no, this was um, this was a fun little match. It it did what it needed to do. It was it was short and sweet, but everything they did was nice. And uh, Steamboat came out looking like a million bucks. Yeah, like it, 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 fantastic athlete. I mean, they're both excellent wrestlers. And Steamboat floats around, pops up in territory stuff, pops up in Ted Turner WCW era, and he, he's in some of their events too. Where and anyways, but always puts on a good match. And yeah, now moving on to the next one, we've got a real gimmick filler match, <laughs> if you can even call it a match. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, well, they say it's nine seconds. I think it actually, it probably lasts a bit longer than nine seconds, but in, in kayfabe, it only goes nine seconds. So it's uh, yeah. King Kong Bundy versus uh, Special Delivery Jones or SD Jones, as he's um, often called. This is just one of those examples of got a new big monster heel in the company. Need to get him over, send him out there, and have him kill a guy because yeah. that's essentially what happened. It's pretty funny actually when you watch the backstage um, interview before this match because SD Jones is a pretty charismatic guy, and he actually does cut like a fiery promo where if you weren't aware of their kind of positions on the on the card you might think oh this guy might might have a chance of winning <laughs> but he doesn't <laughs> as soon as he as soon as the bell rings he just gets mauled and then splashed and pinned uh by by king kong bundy um i'll actually i'll take this opportunity now to mention as well uh, apart from the format of the um of the backstage interview and then the match there's all it'll often cut to Lord Alfred Hayes, Lord Alfred Hayes standing in the aisleway with a microphone, um, kind of introducing wrestlers as they walk past. You'll see him throughout the night, uh, in between matches as well. He looks like he, um, he just doesn't want to be there either. He, he, he <laughs> they have him out there. He must have never gotten the chance to go and like sit down or, or you know, relax backstage because by the time the show the is over and, and yeah he just looks like he's sweating he looks really tired he just looks like he wants to be anywhere else he's kind of he seems a bit nervous on the mic as well maybe he wasn't like ready to do it maybe he was filling in for someone else but yeah i just thought i'd mention um lord alfred there because because you'll see him throughout the show as well but uh yeah so bundy bundy just squashes sd like literally squashes him hits him with the big splash pins him it's over and of yeah. course, for Bundy, this will be the kind of road to next year's mania. Because by the time we get to the sequel to this mania, Mister King Kong Bundy will actually be in the in the main event. So this was that road beginning for him on this event. I, I do enjoy his proper matches, and he's like I don't know he's a fun wrestler to watch, and he does have some fun match other proper full matches later on for company, which which is cool. And speaking of gimmick matches, we're going to the next one, which is another gimmick match. And it's I it, it's pretty silly, but it, I don't know. It's fun. We've got Body Slam Challenge, Andre the Giant, who defeats Big John Stud. And there's like, at the, at the end of it, they have that, like the cash that like reigns, <laughs> like yes. the cash prize. <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, it's $15,000 that's supposed to be yeah. in the bag. Sure I think that's really the... <laughs> Well, I'd say I, it was probably real money, or at least some real money, because the, the be front row money. audience oh, people, yeah, um, he some some lucky front row people definitely got some free money from this match. Uh, when when Andre starts throwing out the, the bucks at the end, but um, no, you know this is, yeah, I know it's one of those kind of daft gimmick matches because even the stipulation, I think it's like if 
if Andre wins, he gets the money. But I think if he loses, he has to retire. It's, it's a the, pretty like a yeah, leave town or one of the sort of ones. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of it's a pretty big risk. Like you know, to are you going to risk your whole yeah. career for like yeah. fifteen grand? But I guess he thought yeah. he, he had a good chance of winning. It's just but, an um, excuse to see two big, massive, powerful guys smashing into each other like once a meet. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I I'll never complain about seeing that sight, and I know everybody um. We always marvel at Andre the Giant and how big he actually is. But like Big John Studd is a monster of a man. Um, yeah, like you, you really have to, you really kind of almost have to forget um, that Andre is there and just kind of focus sometimes on Big John Studd. And if you ever watch any other Big John Studd matches or see just footage of Big, big John Studd beside a normal looking person, like Big John Studd really is huge like he is he is yeah. massive massive dude um one thing i'll say about this match not that it's like a you know a, a fast-paced action-packed stunner or anything but but it is <laughs> nice to see andre still kind of in a level of kind of physical shape where he can still kind of yeah. move around yeah. and do things in the ring like he is a bit slow on his feet or whatever but he's not the way you know obviously he'd turn out in the next few years things would get pretty bad for him for his health wise and stuff it would be almost kind of difficult to watch him like kind of lumbering out and barely being able to to move around the ring but in this match he's he's you know he's pretty nimble by his standards and 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 like you know the audience are really into it they're they're with him all the way and they pop massive uh for the finish and it is a pretty cool moment as well like him chucking the Chucking the money into the into the audience <laughs> and, and causing a bit of chaos while while Stud just yeah. still and he always does that that the goofy grin he always does. Like. Yeah, it's it's a kind of iconic bit of. Um, I think at the end of the match, uh, or maybe it could even be at the start of the introduction. There's one point where he turns to the camera, where Andre turns to the camera and kind of like raises his arm and points his finger. It's kind of they they must have really liked that image because they always use this in anything to do with like if they're doing a best of andre or kind of andre you know retrospective documentaries or anything like that they always show that uh footage of him kind of raising his hand and, and pointing his finger okay we'll move on to our next one and we've got intercontinental championship with junkyard dog and greg the hammer valentine with jimmy hart as the one of the managers this was, um, I suppose, this is a big deal match uh, in a sense that we've got the the first ever defense of the Intercontinental Championship mm. on a on a WrestleMania and the, card. The two big stars from the southern southern territories too, who you know were really popular before, long before they got to WrestleMania. Definitely, and definitely, and as we mentioned earlier, um, when we looked at the Starcade poster, here's one of the one of Starcade's feature stars, uh, Greg the Hammer. Valentine. Yeah, Greg Valentine, was, that dog collar match with yeah, Piper. Ex- exactly, exactly. Um, you know, this is a pretty, pretty entertaining match. Um, considering the circumstances, like Junkyard Dog at this time, I think it's fair to say that physically he'd probably seen better days. I think that, yeah. you know, I'd say outside the ring he's probably going through some maybe troubled times with drinking drugs and stuff around the time this match was happening. Um, but you know, he's still really over with the crowd. Um, he does a good kind of fiery interview before the match as well. They have, I don't, he, he's the only guy, or he's one of the first guys on the show to come out to actual entrance music, but on the network, they have a dub with something that's not whatever he, he should yeah, have come out I'm going to have to look it up and see what it is. But, um, because you can tell when, like, when you're watching on the network, he comes out, the audience are they're like reacting wrong or something like there's something wrong with the soundtrack to the to the crowd reaction and the music is just really loud they kind of like piped in fake music so they obviously didn't want to pay the rights for whatever music he, yeah. he originally came out to so but, it's um, the same when you know it's 90s wcw stuff they don't have the rights for any of that stuff because they didn't properly have it back then so they can't use it again now yeah exactly or they're not willing to to renew the license so they're not willing they, to pay the crazy have, amount of fees <laughs> I wish they'd do it though, even if it was just for me. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, I, just, I, I, just so I like, we could get like, the authentic experience. Yeah. I, I like both these guys a lot. And like, you know, the not, not the greatest match, but like 
as you said, JYD, better stuff in his younger years. And uh, Greg Valentine, always a solid wrestler in just about any era. And even right through the 90s up to 2000, he still kept that amazing hitter here. Where other guys had gone gray and bald. He, he still had a great hitter here. <laughs> Uh, he he he's like a fine wine in, in how he ages. Yeah. Um, we I mean, mentioned he's earlier, so uh, gentle, but he's just tough as hell when you see him in any kind of match. Oh, he's a great wrestler. He's a, he's a fantastic wrestler. And um, we we mentioned earlier in the first match, he had um, he had injured Tito's leg in a, in an angle they did before the show. Yeah, and after the show, him and Tito are going to have a a feud over the Intercontinental Championship. And um, you know, a lot of people often say when they're when they're critical of this show, it's like, well, why didn't they just have Greg versus Tito for the Intercontinental belt on this show, since that was the feud that was going on, you know, going into it. But um, you kind of have to understand that back then, it wasn't about like selling matches on pay per views. That that concept didn't really yeah. exist in the form that we know it now. They were more interested in generating interest for for house show events that they do after yeah, WrestleMania. Like so, if, yeah, exactly. So if they if they had um, had that match on the WrestleMania show, which loads of people watch live and on television, then they're not going to get as much people paying to see it live on the road. So that was the business mentality back then: is that you didn't just give away matches like that. You you know you had to give the the people a reason to to want to buy a ticket to go to these untelevised shows where they would get to see these these matches that was part of the allure whereas now it's kind of turned completely on its head where you've kind of yeah you've kind of educated the audience that only what matters is what happens on television and not what happens on an untelevised live show that's it you hit the nail on the head uh, we'll move on to the next one, which is the World Tag Team Championship with Nikolai Volkov and Iron Sheik with classy Freddy Bassey and Mike Rotundo and Barry Windham. So you got tag match, and I couldn't get a decent quality picture of the other guys. So that's why you got half of the people on the match on screen, unfortunately. It's... Uh... Crazy heat in this match because of the the foreign heels. They were they really hammered yeah. up. Uh, to oh, right. Love, Love Sheik. Sheik at the beginning is like, uh, Iran number one, uh, Russia <laughs> number one, and and the audience are just booing the hell out of him. They just me. hate him, you know. <laughs> really, really hate him. Um, you know, this is a pretty big deal match. It, it's a good match anyway, just a good tag team match. But it's also a big deal because the titles actually switch hands. So. The first, that's the first ever title change right there in, in Mania history. And it's, uh, you know, talk about an evil, disliked, horrible duo of heels to, to win the belts from the All-American boys, uh, Rotundo and Wyndham. Who, by the way, Johnny, you know, yeah. um, you know Hulk Hogan's theme music, Real American? Yeah. Before it was Hulk Hogan's theme music, it was actually Barry Windham's and Mike Rotundo's team music for that tag team. And they actually come out to uh, to Real American on this show, or at least they did originally, uh, but it's been dubbed over now by some generic uh, track because they don't want to make out this. Uh, yeah, Visuals. they don't want to make out that somebody had that music before Hogan. That's that's probably Hogan trying to, to erase history there. But uh, just thought I'd let you know that little factoid this uh, Rotundo and yeah, Wendham had the real American man. theme song. They had a first brother. <laughs> and so following match, we had the women's championship with Wendy Richter and Cindy Lauper, Leilani Kai, and with the fabulous Moolah. So we had it. You got a match, and then we've got, you know, like, managers slash guests sort of but you know they're, they're, they're all women so it's all like um you know making an, another kind of spectacle match because they didn't really have serious women's wrestling in this particular era or if they did it usually wasn't very good yeah it was um it definitely was not what it is today and you know they'll, they'll, there's yeah. many aspects of of modern wrestling that I do often criticize and I bemoan 
for the days of old where wrestling was a particular way. There, if there's one thing I will say that modern wrestling, yeah, look, I, I will say this about modern wrestling. Women's matches are much better in the modern times. Yeah, you've got they proper were back, events back. and leagues and stuff. They're actually, you know, they're all proper athletes and not just there to be eye candy, you know, they're proper athletes. Exactly, exactly. Now, this match, though, this is a strange match when look back on now because they're they're in a funny place historically um or to look back in this historically at the moment because it looks like they're going to a Halloween party or something. Yeah. <laughs> well you've got you've got Fabulous Mula who was embroiled in a lot of controversy recently so they don't really like talking about her anymore. Yeah. So and you also Wendy Richter, even though she's kind of back in good graces with the company, there were years and years where she wasn't. So she was kind of erased from history as well. So it's funny sometimes when you when you see any um you know historical documentaries or anything that's looking back on on the first WrestleMania, especially if it's a WWE produced documentary, you'll notice that they almost frame it like Cindy Lauper was nearly more part of the main event with Hogan and, and Mr. T as opposed to having anything to do with, with this match. It's almost like they just yeah, don't want true. you to remember that this match happened at all. Like, they want you to remember that Cindy Lauper was at the event, but they don't really ever go into the context of what it was she was doing there. You actually have to watch the show to see what it is that she does. And I think that's largely to do with the fact this fabulous Mula and, and Wendy Richter, they just don't really want to acknowledge their existence anymore for you know various reasons you can look them up folks uh, i won't go into them now but there's lots of stuff going on there and um, not to tarnish the uh the reputation <laughs> of wendy richter she didn't do anything wrong it was actually the wf that, that that did her wrong but you can look that up if you don't know what i'm talking about but um the match itself it's uh it's kind of sloppy compared to what we've seen on the on the, on the show up yeah. until now like there's a few kind of botchy moves and stuff and but I suppose it does ultimately accomplish what it set out to do, and that's get Cindy on the show. I think the plan was at the time to probably launch Wendy Richter as a kind of a, a big female star, like the way Hogan was being launched as a big kind of male star. But in the case of Richter, she was gone from the company within a few months, so that never ended up uh, materializing. So uh, once again, that's probably another reason why they don't they don't really like going back and and looking at this match in in any real detail. But Lauper, it's funny as well. Like it's uh, she's clearly a massive star at the time and and well known. I don't know how over she is like with the New York people. They kind of just give her like a a lukewarm response, I suppose. At the end of the match, she's kind of like dancing around and celebrating with Wendy Richter, and the audience is kind of like, "Oh yeah, okay." Good for you. <laughs> but uh no, it's uh it's uh it's it's definitely not the the technical masterpiece of a match that, that you would expect from some of the male competitors on the roster at the time. There are some some goofy looking spots and uh that like not to really I'm sure look there's there's probably a lot of factors there as well. It, it seems like they're kind of being rushed through time wise as well. They're obviously trying to like jump from spot to spot and just, you know, get all their shit in and, and you know, get the get the match done and just get out of there. Yeah, you sum, summed it up fairly well. Um so we're gonna coming up next, we're gonna move on to some of the main events and also talk a little bit about before we get that about the rock and wrestling and just before that we're going to have a little pause a little break a little refreshment and we'll be right back. and we're back guys it's the end of our intermission we're going to talk a little bit about the rock and wrestling i'll read some of boring old text out and Boba will give you some insider information so the Rock and Wrestling Connection, the WWF Rock and Wrestling Connection was a significant 1980s era in professional wrestling that blended wrestling with pop culture featuring iconic figures like Hulk Hogan and Cyndi Lauper. It introduced wrestling to a mainstream audience, utilised MTV and a Saturday morning cartoon, 
and led to the creation of WrestleMania, shaping WWE's approach to entertainment. So it was like a cross-media blitz. You had your MTV, you had your wrestling shows, and, you know, you had other, similar to your Lawler Hoffman, you had other media and stuff getting involved and reporting on it and creating a lot of buzz, a lot of hype. It was uh, it was massive crossover uh, appeal at the time, you know, because like we mentioned earlier, because you've you've got these big stars like Mr. T and Cindy Lauper who are still kind of current, but then you also have kind of almost these like legendary figures of the, of the time, like Liberace and Muhammad Ali. Like there was just the kind of it was like this nexus point of all these kind of different stars from from you know sports music you know entertainment or whatever all just kind of mashing in with with these wrestlers like these modern wrestlers of the time it's 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 a weird kind of thing because now nowadays we just take all this stuff for granted that there's always been that kind of celebrity connection but it really was unheard of to have this level of just publicity and celebrity involvement like you know the and like Hogan and T, like they're appearing on talk shows. They're they're doing so much stuff to hype the event. Um, it's really like it's like nothing that had ever been seen before. And then at this time as well, MTV is still a real force. Um, people probably listening, maybe some younger people be thinking like MTV. Well, that's just this random channel that's not that good on my, you know cable set full of like hundreds of channels and back then it's MTV, not now. <laughs> it's a big deal. yeah it's um but well, i think bobby the brain heenan described it as um or he said that mtv stands for music to vomit by <laughs> that's it but it was a big deal back then mtv it was a really big deal for them to be doing that type of uh crossover yeah there was a time where mtv was cool and hip and fashionable and it had all the amazing music videos in the early when music videos were actually fucking music videos and not just like complete nonsense like real miniature films that did really amazing creative stuff and it's it's definitely yeah. an area we won't we'll see again because now it's all streaming and networks and you can just you can't have the same thing again it's not like i mean you know in, in martial arts tournaments in the 60s bruce lee met chuck norris because he went to watch him in competition that's how, that's how you met him watching him in competitions and you know we can see ufc and undertaker or stone cold had regularly turned up at ufc's and were bits like there's undertaker and there's stone cold and because they just like watching the fights it wasn't part of a story or angle they just like the fights but this was a whole other level of like not just a fight or a wrestler watching but you know people from different cross media and different platforms all coming together and it's very orchestrated it's very heavily marketed but it, it, it's pulled off well the execution is good and it worked it hooked in people who otherwise wouldn't have given a crap about wrestling and brought in more of a mainstream audience and, and give it more cross appeal you know hogan of course was appearing in some fairly horrible films but <laughs> other than rocky the rocky was good but the other films he was in you know you missed a nanny and suburban commando as he went on to his film career as horrible as they were it, it did help to grow wrestling to a more mainstream audience even terrible shows like thunder and paradise where it's like night road with a boat <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole a whole episode we could do on thunder and paradise yeah there's always a canal oh a night boat always a canal <laughs> yeah famous famous music video here and we did mention yeah. briefly earlier that um captain lou does play um Cindy's father and the girls just want to have fun video, which is actually, I I'm not sure how he stumbled into the gig, whether he knew her before the video or whether they actually met on set. But but either way, coming out of this video, these two become like fast friends. Um, yeah. You know, Cindy Lauper and Lou Albano, to the point where he's actually the the man, the middleman, so to speak, that actually gets her in the door of getting into negotiations with Vince to actually do um, WrestleMania and to build up to WrestleMania. So if it wasn't yeah. for that, 
connection with Captain Lou and Cindy Lauper, there's a probably uh you know, there's probably no chance that she would have even had anything to do with the company at all. Because he, he he was literally the their link into that mainstream was was through his relationship with Cindy. I I never knew as a kid, I never knew about Lou Albano as a wrestler because he was, you know, he's kind of like Seemed to retired at this time and doing, you know, like the manager type role or guest appearances. I always knew him as Super Mario on the Super Mario show. <laughs> yeah, he is. Um, he's obviously like he's a legendary uh, manager within wrestling. Like he was definitely, he would have been definitely well known even on a national level through his, uh, through yeah. his exposure um, in wrestling. But it was that uh, the involvement with that music video in particular, it kind of got his name out there a lot. Because I, I don't think it's the only video he appears in. He might, he might be in another Lauper video, or at least in some other kind of, um, you know, contemporary pop video at the time. I think he makes a, another appearance in. But it, there, there's, you can't doubt that he played a, a very significant role in getting her involved in Mania. Because, like I said, I just, I just don't, I don't see how she would have even been brought up, even been approached, to how they would have ever gotten her on board if it wasn't for the fact that she was already uh, good mates with Captain Lou. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened without him for sure. Um, and she was a good sport too, because she played up a few different angles in the sort of build up to WrestleMania and and the aftermath. They had, you know, I mean, I mean the sequels, but also on the. Uh, weekly TV shows. They did other spots and bits with Piper, Hogan, Orton, and Cindy Lauper, like the infamous one um, part where Roddy Piper kicks Cindy Lauper like yeah. right in the gut, the throat smasher on the ground and kick, does like a kind of soccer ball kick right into her guts. <laughs> and it's pretty vicious and horrible, but, it, but it's a work. I mean, Piper plays it up like, oh, yeah, I kicked her for real. It's, like, it's a work. If you kicked her for real, she'd be in the fucking hospital. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> But yeah, the, um, so we're coming up, of course, to the main event. And but before you get to the main event, you have to stop over in Piper's Pit. So Piper's Pit was a segment where Piper would just cut loose with these crazy over-the-top promos where he would insult people who were supposed to be interviewing, like an interview segment. And he'd he'd hit people in the head with coconuts. He'd push them through walls. He'd make fun of small people. He'd make fun of big people like Andre and say how dumb he was and and just did all the crazy heel tactics that like really helped sell his character at a time when Vince was kind of trying to push him out of the company and Piper was the one fighting to stay in there and said, give me a chance and put me on the microphone and let me talk and came up with all these memorable cra crazy scenarios. Uh, so one of the central storylines... Uh, and the lead-up involved Rowdy Roddy Piper feuding with Hulk Hogan and Mr. P. Mr. P. Mr. T, sorry. <laughs> Mr. P. <laughs> no, the intermission's over. Let's get um, They used Piper's pit to taunt and insult Hogan and Mr. T, leading to a heated rivalry. And like it, it's a, it, they have such good heat with um, Piper and T because he really has so much fun just goading Mr. T at like the interviews and the other stuff. And you can see even in clips now where he gets genuinely pissed off and goes to shove him or smack him. And Piper's like, oh, you can't touch me. You're too slow. <laughs> um, so Cindy Lauper, Piper's disrespect for pop star Cindy Lauper, which is, which is the story, the storyline. It's not saying he actually hates it. Um, further fueled the rivalry. Lauper was a close friend of Wet and Wendy Richter, a female wrestler, and her involvement added a celebrity angle to the feud. The war to settle the score, and this is one of the major setups leading to WrestleMania. Um, there was an MTV special called The War to Settle the Score. During this event, tension bo tensions boiled over in Piper's pit, leading to a brawl between Piper, Hogan, and Mr. T. This incident escalated animosity between the two sides. And as Piper says in his documentary and in his book you can't have a wrestlemania and the hogan build up without piper and you can fans can still debate who was the real star of this event and show was it piper or was it hogan because hogan is a guy who's always been pushed as the face he's been pushed really hard to be this you know the all-american and prayers and vitamins and piper he did such great work just being 
making the crowd absolutely hate him and making it just pissing everybody off with his crazy promos and crazy in your face style and off the cuff remarks a lot of the um crazy stuff he comes up that he wrote himself he'd write himself little notes and one-liners and things and like the one about he uses in the john carpenter film about the um kick up time to kick ass and chew gum and i'm all out of gum like he, he came up with that and john carpenter liked that and they used it in the film so he was good at coming up with his one-liners and crazy stuff yeah he's very very quick-witted piper yeah and good at you pissing know, people off. yeah he's really good at pissing people off and it's perfectly reasonable to you know whether or not you'd say who was the bigger star as far as this event is concerned, he was probably at least equal with Hogan on a on a wrestling level of stardom because yeah, yeah Hogan and uh, Hogan and Mr. T were all over TV together, but Piper was also on a lot of different TV shows and a lot of promotional um you know angles and things leading up to Mania to the point where you know it would probably be fair to say that he was at least on a par with who because like he was the agitator he was the reason why yeah everybody was why it was all kind of kicking off and like you said you know you, that, that 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 is hilarious when when he goes to, to smack him and he and he dodges and, and all those kind of heated exchanges <laughs> he's really good at just like riling it up and right there on the spot you can see he is just like losing it like he really just does not like him and it's yeah, uh he's losing his cold but Piper's pit, even just as a as its own kind of segment and its its influence in wrestling, like it was the original wrestling talk show kind of weekly yeah. segment. Before your King's Court and all those. And... Yeah, before your King's Court, before your your highlight reels or snake pits or peep shows or like they've done, they've just continued them. Carlitos Cabana. I could like there's one, there's a new one every year essentially to just keep going and going. Yeah, and going. Well, Alexa Bliss had one, but it wasn't terribly good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And to be honest, not many of them really have been since the the eighties, really. Like the like Piper's was always the best, and yeah. then there was a few okay ones after that. But I think the thing what really worked about Piper's pit was Piper himself. Because he was so animated yeah, and hyper and energy, because man. he was so quick witted. Because like he's even if you have somebody as a guest that's maybe not that exciting to listen to, Hyper would make the situation exciting or funny or interesting. He was just really good at bringing the he best out a few of people. people. Was, but... <laughs> he did. He broke the coconut over Snooker's head. He yeah. he he was a big deal. Um, because you know, because even going you know after this like the piper pits that continue on like it's on piper's pit where the big hogan and andre kind of you know andre ripping the cross off hogan's neck and stuff like there's a yeah. there's a lot of big kind of historical moments that happen in piper's pit and since piper is like the the host that means that he's front and center for for a lot of their kind of big deal historical 80s kind of moments so you know, like circling back to what we were saying initially, like, yeah, I, I do think anybody who says, like, whether or not you'd say Piper was a bigger star than Hogan, I don't know if I'd agree with that, but I would definitely say he was at least equal to him, especially in the in the, in the the kind of build-up to this event. He was presented as the yeah. opposite of that coin. And, and also, um, Piper was, had become a face in the some of the southern territories promotions and then became a heel in wwf so you know he'd, he'd been both sides and knew how to work good different angles and how to do what was best for business and despite being um at a point where he was starting to get pushed out of the out of the company as, as the decade went on he was incredibly protective of his spot as well piper like yeah. while they were both together in wwf like Hulk Hogan never pinned Roddy Piper. He never beat him in a match, ever. Yeah. I don't know if you know that, like, but he ne- like while they were in WWF, that never happened because Piper was he was very protective of his of his image, and he kind of knew, or at least he didn't trust Hogan to the point where he thought that, well, if I ever did lose to Hogan, I don't know if Hogan would actually lose to me, so I'm just not going to take that chance. Yeah, I'm that not going to make. Himself, he wouldn't. He, he wasn't willing to make himself look weak if he wasn't if the favor wasn't going to be returned but um he he was always very protective of his spot and of course mm. you see and here the, right, the whole Bret Hart business too like 
it's it, it's not about being selfish it's that if you're not locking up for yourself in a company where you know the other guy is buddy buddy with the owner slash promoter of the company and if you have a bad week or two that's it they're just going to forget about you and move on to the next guy so if he looks weak and loses and then we have to go and find someone else and build up all the tension and promos all over again yeah and it's um you know look there's a reason that big stars are big stars in the first place like and you don't get to the top by just being super agreeable and nice to, yeah. to everybody you you do have to look out for yourself and make sure like like it's what separates the the jobber jabronis from the the big time main eventers like ultimately you know and especially it's probably one of the main reasons why modern wrestling has lost a lot of its its luster at least to people like me because you know now that everybody cares so little about the the wins and losses that that you know somebody yeah. losing to somebody else ma- makes no difference it's just all a job and money and nobody cares whereas you know i i actually do have a lot of respect for people like roddy piper and brad harsh who did take it seriously and who were thinking about their own equity further down the line because you have to remember as well if if you're on the wwf national television program and you're losing so like hogan beats you and then a few other baby faces beat you if you then end up leaving the wwf and try to go back to the nwa or wcw you're going to be worth less to them because you've just been seen on national television losing to the top guys in the wwf so why are you why would you be as valuable then to the nwa or wcw you wouldn't be and piper piper smart like piper knew that he's like you know ultimately it was about roddy piper it wasn't about the wwf you know it was about him like he was he was who you looked after you look after yourself and i i do actually yeah. respect that that kind of mindset well, but piper had a good um I, I don't i don't know i'm saying he piper is good at business but he knew he knew the business pretty well from being in the southern territories and seeing firsthand what vince was doing it was very transparent to him he had seen the old events would be like you know you mark you would be like you know like you joe lewis or muhammad ali or whoever versus whoever chuck norris versus bruce lee that was like what sold tickets um you know piper versus hogan but when vince came to town and started buying up promotions and promoting things he very specifically intentionally wanted to change that to be like no if something's coming to town it's not this guy versus this guy it's the wwf that that's at the top that's the top billing you're buying a ticket to this event like going to a baseball game or a sports game or basketball it's not about the players it's about the event itself and piper knew knew that and even you know had had arguments with vince about that about you know billing and how, how it worked and so he he was smart you know he had, he had street smarts and real world smarts as far as seeing what, what, all the changes that were going on in the business yeah definitely he was um he could see what was ahead of of the entire business because ultimately it did end up becoming like you described it became wwe the show spectacle as opposed yeah, to well who is it that's actually wrestling in the main event and it took them it took them a long time to get there but but the early seeds were being planted as as far as as back here um yeah but you know they they would they would eventually get to to the point where it was just about the company name that was they were depending on to draw the crowd as opposed to an individual match or an individual star yeah and the same with all the celebrities and the hoopla and mtv you know it's making it a big event like a super bowl or a world series as opposed to just another weekly you know wrestling house show or whatever So here we have the um that's from the actual main event the the main event show and then that that's a bit from piper's piss if i'm not mistaken where he's yeah yeah you can you can see that like two dollars set behind them (laughs) yeah who is it holding the microphone i wonder or or, oh no i know pipe no piper's who's the guy in the suit the guy in the suit beside hogan yeah he just got my attention for some reason I don't know. At first, I thought it was Vince. I'm like, no, it's not Vince. It's someone else. But I don't. I don't recognize. 
Yeah, it could be like one of the agents, maybe, or something yeah. just about to uh, I love separate. The, but all the colors here with like the all, all the four, four guys and like the reds and the blues, like it's, it's such a cool photo. All the colors, it's awesome. We forgot to kind of mention, I suppose, the other parts of this mm. this main event yeah. scene, like uh, you know, Piper's partner Paul Paul Orndorff, who is a fantastic yes. wrestler at the time, a brilliant physique, um, yeah, and a, and a top. A top heel, um, and wonderful. And Hogan did a lot of big business in the WWF, the their feud, because it was the classic kind of um Hogan feud. It always goes the same way. There, he's tag partners with a guy for a while, then the guy becomes jealous of Hogan because, of yeah. course, everybody has to be jealous of Hogan, <laughs> and uh, and he betrays him and turns on him. But uh, wonderful was one of the first kind of the first one of those big betrayals. So he was a, a big deal. And sometimes, you know, it's another one of those things he's kind of forgotten about in history, especially when you look back on this show, because you tend to even nearly forget that Piper had a partner or was accompanied yeah. by, you know, Cowboy and, Bob and on was, the outside as well. Yeah, and of sometimes it's kind I, of I don't, a, a, yeah. I don't know if it was a rumor or not, just a possible thing, but the, the angle with Cowboy Bob where he had the broken hand, like he did, have an actual broken hand but then once it was healed they played out the gimmick of having the cast on so there was a possibility that cowboy bob was going to be in this match but because he was still not not 100 that that orndorff was in there but i don't know if it was just a rumor or just just hearsay but that was kind of in the background of this yeah it's, it's floating around as a as a possibility i i would have a feeling that that wonderful yes, probably no, was going you know. to I, I I could see Vince preferring wonderful the Norton purely because of how oh, he looks younger and stronger. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you know, in a in a different world, maybe if maybe if Hogan didn't leave the AWA, or maybe if things hadn't worked out with Hogan, maybe it would be Paul Orndorff who was the yeah. the top guy. Because when you see a lot of the yeah. um, Paul Orndorff when he was tagging with Hogan, when you see them side by side, there are times when you kind of think. That Orndorff, he definitely wrestles better than Hogan, and he's just yeah, as big sure. as Hogan. He also has a full head of hair, which Hogan doesn't have. <laughs> um, so who knows? Now he just wasn't quite as charismatic as Hogan, but he could still talk. So who knows? Yeah, who knows? Was, Maybe I... there's a, a parallel universe out there with a where we're all just talking about former 14-time world champion uh, Paul Orndorff as the king of wrestling. But who knows? Yeah, so ju just like it, our show has gotten a few studio sequels, WrestleMania, of course. Um, was it a lot of risk for Vince putting up the money? There was a very good chance he could have lost the company or gone bankrupt doing it. And fortunately for him and the guys who had jobs, they did succeed and led to some sequels. And here's, here's just some images of WrestleManias 1 through 4 and some of the other classic matchups you know you got the king kong bundy and andre of course and once hogan body slammed andre i don't know he broke every bone in his body and was i don't know telling telling they're not telling every porcupine could years later about this match that makes sense but it was it was not the greatest match in the world but it was in, 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 entertaining yeah i think um what i would say to anybody especially if you're a if you're like a current fan for want of a better term or if you're just a bit younger if, if you're ever watching any of these old shows i would just say park your idea of whatever you think makes a good match at the door because chances are you're not going to see the <laughs> type of match that, that you want to see it was just it was a different time it was a time when doing a body slam to a bigger guy was a massive Deal. It was a time when sometimes yeah. even just hitting somebody with a big boot or a punch was a big deal. It was all about timing and moment and emotion, uh, not so much flashiness and you know high risk, whatever. And that's not me being like an old man shouting at a cloud. Like I do enjoy aspects of modern wrestling, and there are modern wrestlers and modern wrestling matches that I can enjoy. But um, least... I just think it's kind of maybe it's important maybe just to take note that if if you are kind of coming to these shows with a pair of fresh eyes and, and you've never seen them before um, 
and you are a, a modern wrestling fan, you might want to adjust your your mindset to getting used to a, a slower pace of action, to put it generously. Yeah, I, 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 I still uh, love it. And I love watching these and I love watching AWA and Super Clash and bloody Starcade or any, any of that stuff from back then is great entertainment. Oh, big time. Or oh, Bash and, you know, the it Beach. Was, um, <laughs> it was just at a time when, you know, because sometimes people will scoff and be like, oh, well, it's just all phony and fake anyway. And it's like, well, that is true to an extent, yes, but they made a lot more efforts to to make you feel like they were taking it seriously and it was real to them. Yeah. So you could actually lose yourself in the moment. Like when when you see Mr. T trying to slap Brody Piper, there's nothing fake going on there. No, that's that's a man who's he's, gotten, <laughs> he's gotten really fucking angry. He's been insulted. And in that moment, he's yeah. trying to exact physical vengeance on the man who's just insulted him. Like that, that's the beauty of, of this era of wrestling. You sometimes are not quite sure what's yeah. always a work and what's always a shoot, especially on, on things that are happening outside of the ring. Um, Just like, look, like you were saying earlier. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And look, like, like you're saying, like you've, you've, you've read Piper's book and it's been said many times on here. Him and T just did not get along. So you'd expect it worked out great for the event. <laughs> Yeah, like one thing, even if social media existed back in the day, one thing you definitely would not have seen is pictures of Roddy Piper and Mr. T hanging out together. No, nah, you know Roddy you wouldn't Piper have seen them um, in two seconds from every platform on earth. <laughs> oh, big time! Yeah, oh, he would have been cancelled. He would have been cancelled before he even got Cancel. on the platform. As before he's born. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, the sequels vary in quality. Just we'll say that yeah. much. Mostly, I would say uh, they're all worth watching. They're they're all worth watching. Um, some some a lot more than others, but definitely you should watch them all at least once. At least go from um, I would say one to thirty. Uh, yeah. You're you're doing okay. We're coming up to forty now next year. Like I can't believe I'm still watching this shit. <laughs> like the the first ten to me is sort of like just that whole era of like your mid to like eighties going into the nineties. It's just a whole thing that can never be repeated or happen again. And, you know, even seeing the cha the changes in the wrestling cards and the, some of the gimmicks, the characters, the fashion, the music, it's, it's real time capsule. We're just looking back and seeing, seeing everything in these events and, and the different celebrities that pop up and some come back again and we get different celebrities. And this, this, first WrestleMania that we've just covered, like I know I, I mentioned it kind of briefly at the start, but it's it's especially noticeable if you go now and watch these sequel WrestleManias, none of them will really look like WrestleMania 1. WrestleMania 1 by comparison still looks like an old timey wrestling show. In, yeah, in it looks like a watch it. It. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 like the rest of the manias as they progress on the more the further in time you go, the more of a spectacle they become. Whereas that and, original and mania, it was value. very much a, a dingy type of dimly lit, you know, old timey show. Yeah, those blurry house lights and the glare. <laughs> I think it was um I think the name of the man is Dick Aversall. He was one of the producers on NBC, but he ended up kind of working alongside Vince for, for TV production after Mania yeah. 1. I think he's mainly responsible for uh, changing up the overall look at the product. It was his decision to start lighting the crowd instead of just the ring. Yeah. Um, so it looked like you could, you know, so you'd see I, those I, I color and loads of faces. Yeah. It definitely, if you're the um, audience at home, it really involves you more being able to see the crowd's reactions instead of just. It's, it's like if you go to a concert or a stand up comedian, and it's all, you know, if you're in the audience live, it's one thing. But if you're watching it back, it's just seeing this person in this oasis or black hole of nothing. It's like, what are they doing? So it's much more um, in, involved when you can see the, see the crowd and all that. So I, I do enjoy the increased production values and. The, the important thing is, I hope they all just checked with Jack Tunney before they did any, any of any of that stuff and got his permission to 
make some more videos. <laughs> so that brings us to the end of our slideshow tonight, and there's just, just showing off the main event guys there again. Oh, absolute, absolutely entertaining characters and wrestlers. Whether you love them or hate them or don't care, they're all, they're all very entertaining and did their part. Yeah, Snooker's there. We we kind of forgot to mention Snooker. He's another guy who's yeah, kind of been forgotten about because, <laughs> yeah, he he ended up having quite a checkered past that was only kind of revealed yeah. after he he yeah. retired yeah. from the business. <laughs> and he I, so, but yeah, you 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 won't see too much of Snooker in any WWF historical documentaries anymore. Let's put it that way. Yeah, he is in some of the older documentaries, but then past a certain point, yeah, you just. It, 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 there's a bit of a fair bit of re revisionism that goes on because it's you know it's that business mindset it's like whoa everything was great and everything turned out wonderful and then we put on an event and a show and anything bad that happened just sweep it under the rug and keep moving forward that's pretty much their policy never mention it again never mention it again. <laughs> oh well we'll um finish up the show there so thanks for tuning in and listening to us talk about wrestling Thanks, everybody. Hopefully this was a, an enjoyable listen for you all. I believe we made it to six episodes. Yeah, and we're, we're pl planning to be doing some more of these too. Like, not, I mean, more Boba Joe shows, but do some more WrestleMania talks and wrestling stuff. And feel free to let us know who, who was your favorite on the card or out of these matches or whether you don't give a crap and never watched any of it, I mean, you, you could go and watch it, nothing to stop if you want to check it out. I just know if you think the card absolutely sucks. I know lots of people yeah. do, and I and I was maybe even among them for a while, but sometimes you have to go back and, and look at these things through older eyes to really appreciate uh, how significant that they were. Oh, yeah. Thanks, everyone.